Okay, welcome everyone. I think we can make a start with uh, hit the two o'clock British time. Welcome everyone to today's webinar from the Institute of Operational Risk. Just a reminder that the um, IOR is the only professional institute dedicated solely to the study of operational risk management. And um, you may be aware that the IOR joined the wider IRM group a few years ago. Um, if you're not a member, I definitely encourage you to investigate joining because I think it delivers great value. We have some really good um, events and there are some great opportunities to network and to really uh, have those conversations with that wider risk community. Um, you'll see the link to the website on the last slide in the deck. Uh, so I encourage you to have a look there. So we have a fascinating topic today and a greater panel of speakers, which I think is um, testament to the fact that we have, I think, almost a record number of people signing up for this webinar, which shows the uh, the great interest, uh, which is really uh, excellent. My name's uh, Jimmy Hinchliffe, so I've been involved with the institute for uh, far too long since the uh, since the beginning, and indeed with the predecessor to the IOR, which was the Operational Risk Research Forum, which goes way back to the nineteen nineties. Um, I'm a, a former board member of the Institute and for four years until last year, I was chairman of the biggest chapter in the Institute uh, in England and Wales. And I'm also a fellow of the, of the Institute. So see on the screen there, the topic for today, emerging operational risks from challenging economic headwinds and what can be done to manage them. Um, as we say, we live in interesting times or have done for the last two or three years. Um, we're all very obviously very aware of the COVID-19 pandemic and then um, the responses to that in terms of the use of things like the lockdowns. We then swiftly following that have the Ukraine war and the impact of that on energy prices and um, creating a huge amount of volatility more generally in markets. Um, and then we've had, I guess, more recently more and more economies moving towards or actually into recession, including, of course, the UK. And this uh, extreme volatility in a whole range of economic um, indicators. So what we're going to do today, obviously, we're all aware of the kind of the drivers and the headwinds. But I think the focus for today's event is very much considering, you know, what does this mean? The so what? What does this mean for operational risk in terms of the operational risk that can be created by these uh, headwinds? And what should operational risk managers be doing about it? Uh, hopefully to avoid maybe some of the uh, impacts that followed from the, the global financial crisis. Uh, so we have, uh, as I say, a, a brilliant panel today. Uh, so let's uh, start off by asking each of our panelists to give a brief introduction to themselves. And if we could start with, uh, with Dominic, if you could unmute yourself and give a quick intro, uh, that would be great. Um... Good morning, good afternoon to everyone. My name is uh, Dominic Wu. I'm the uh, lead person of the Hong Kong chapter uh, of the Institute of Operation Risk, uh, which was formed, I think, uh, in June uh, 2010. So uh, it's already marked you know, the 12th anniversary uh, of the first uh, chapter in Asia. Yeah, And uh, I myself actually um, running the risk department uh, for a pension fund uh, trustee based in Hong Kong. And uh, before, you know, uh, doing job uh, there, actually, um, I will work in uh, 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 various, you know, uh, financial institutions, you know, ranging from uh, uh, investment bank to uh, uh, commercial bank, private bank, uh, as well as, you know, trust bank and uh, asset management and securities company, right? So, you know, based in uh, Hong Kong, uh, but also have exposure, you know, to different parts in Asia. Yeah, so um, actually, I do enjoy, you know, uh, by uh, period with the Institute of Operation Risk, now I think it's under the uh, Institute of Risk Management. And also, you know, work uh, with all of my uh, our peers, right? And actually, you know, try to, uh, you know, learn from them as well as to promote, you know, uh, the good, uh, the best practice of operational risk. Uh, thank you. Great, thanks, uh, Dominic. Uh, Thomas, you know, obviously you're looking at a beautiful uh, landscape there. Can we ask you to give a quick, uh, quick intro? Um, yeah, of course. Thanks a lot, Jimmy, for inviting me to this webinar. Unfortunately, this is just a virtual background. There was a photo from our last holidays uh, to South Africa, uh, which actually links to the topic because we returned just a day before the Omicron uh, variant uh, hit Europe. 
and borders were, were closed to some degree and so forth. Um, so I've been working in operations for about 25 years, uh, both within banks uh, as well as for banks. Um, currently, I'm uh, a self-employed uh, consultant on operational risk and non-financial risk more broadly. I also teach uh, risk management with a focus on non-financial risk at university, uh, both in Germany and also in other areas like Vietnam. Where I'm running a course on enterprise risk management. I'm looking forward to discussing uh, with you later on. Great. Thank, thanks very much. Uh, James, can I ask you to give a quick intro to yourself? Thanks, Jimmy. My name is Jim Fries. I'm an American based in the United States right now, though I work more than half my career in Europe. I started as a central banker focused on financial stability issues, then moved to the U.S. Treasury Department, the Finance Ministry, through the financial crisis. After that, moved to Frankfurt, Germany, working with the Deutsche Börse Group and Europe systemically significant financial market infrastructures as the chief compliance officer, but implementing a lot of the regulatory framework together with uh, OPERIS colleagues to promote the resiliency of those infrastructures. Two years ago, I moved to a global fintech, a payments firm called Wirecard. And on my first day, uncovered a massive amount of fraud um, and eventually put the entity into insolvency as its CEO. But I spent this time two years ago working with all of its customers trying to ensure uh, resiliency as they had uh, unexpected op risk materialize with one of their material suppliers, which is part of the theme I'll come back to. Now I'm focused on uh, fintechs, um, and one of them is a startup that provides some operational risk management solutions that I'll come back to in a few minutes. Great, thanks very much, Jim. And last but not least, Michael, give us a quick uh, intro. Hi, Jimmy, can you see me? Yep. Oh, wait, brilliant. Okay. Um, so my name is Michael Grimwood. Uh, like Jimmy and Thomas, I first worked in operational risk management over 25 years ago, and I've held a senior a series of senior operational risk roles at Lloyd's TSB, RBS, MEFG Securities, uh, and then currently I'm head of operational risk at ICBC Standard Bank. Uh, I've also previously been a board member of the Institute of Operational Risk. Uh, as I'm sure uh, some of you may be aware, over the years I've published a series of peer-reviewed articles in different journals and a couple of books. Most recently, uh, last December, my book entitled 10 Laws of Operational Risk. Uh, and again, some of you may be aware that on a weekly basis, I post a presentation with some extracts of that book. Great, thanks very much, uh, Michael. Okay, so today uh, today's format is that each of the panelists is going to give a, about a 10 minute uh, presentation and we'll try and be pretty strict in terms of the timing. It's always a challenge, I know. Uh, and then we will get into uh, a Q&A uh, session. And I know we already have well over um, well over 300 people have joined already. Uh, so I'm expecting that we will get a lot of really good uh, questions coming in. So please send those through. Uh, I think using the chat function is probably the easiest. Uh, and then I will put those to the, to the panelists. So before we get into the first uh, presentation uh, from Michael, what we'll do up front actually is just to do a quick quick poll. Uh, so let me launch this uh, poll now. And if you could all um, complete it, that would be really good. It's a good uh, way to start the, start the session. Uh, so what are the risk types and threats most likely to increase due to the challenging economic headwinds? Once we have the answers, I might ask um, our panelists to quickly give uh, their initial thoughts on on the responses. Cyber is certainly something that we spend a lot of time talking mm. about and concerned about.
Okay, I think we got most people have responded over 80%. So let's end the poll and then share the results. See where we are. Hopefully everyone can see those. Uh, so internal theft and fraud, 53%. External fraud, 51%. Um, conduct, mis-selling, 37. Compliance regulatory risk, 36. Cyber attack, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, the most popular single um, risk that people have cited and then a human error. Any thoughts from panelists? Quick, any quick thoughts from panelists to those are results before we press on with the presentations? Looks like the operational risk uh, persons here are trying to minimize the human error because of their great processes and policies. <laughs> Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Okay, let's... Uh, Let's stop sharing that. Okay, so let me uh, now ask uh, Michael uh, to do your presentation, about 10 minutes. Thanks, Jimmy. Um, if we just move on to the um, first slide. Um, I've set out here um, a simple overarching formula for losses that firms may suffer in a particular year. I think over time, appetite should approximate to the losses that settle in, in an individual year. And those are driven by events which occur in that year, plus also the detection of loss events from prior years that drives the frequency of events. And then the severity is a combination of the duration of the events and the rapidity with which losses are incurred. And then finally, we need to reflect the fact that uh, not all losses crystallize immediately. There are lags between detection and settlement, and there are also lags in terms of recovery. Um, so if we now have a look at what the consequences were of the global financial crisis. So Jimmy, if you flick onto the next slide, um, what you can see, I've just annotated this formula for looking at changes in the patterns of losses that were greater than $100 million that were suffered by the 30 GSIBs. Those are the 30 largest banks in the world. Um, and what you can see is that basically comparing the 10 years before, the 11 years before the global financial crisis to 11 years afterwards, is that the frequency of occurrence increases by about threefold. And actually severity increases by about threefold as well through a combination of a small increase in duration and a larger increase in velocity. Uh, and then there's also a slight extension in the lags between detection and settlement. Um, and I think there are really, um, I think what this uh, really illustrates is that operational risk is really quite sensitive to economic shocks, but it's not sensitive to any economic change. Um, from the research I've carried out, it's really sensitive to uh, changes which are both rapid and significant. And the types of things it's sensitive to are changing customer behaviours and demand, changes in delinquency rates and corporate default rates, and movements in markets, whether that's up or down in terms of interest rates and asset values and increased volatility. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, we can then start to see why this might be. So um, I think economic shocks can influence occurrence of events, um, and that's through partly changing behaviours. Um, and we'll see later on on a slide, I've highlighted that actually maybe the initial uh, level or impact of an economic shock on operational risk losses is that they go down because some customer behaviors decrease. So there'll be less demand potentially for loans or mortgages uh, if people perceive there is an economic downturn coming. Um, and we may also see changes in criminal behavior. Um, so in the financial crisis, what we saw was a reduction in the number of application frauds, but an increase in account takeover fraud. Um, and we'll also see an increase in customers that resort to fraud out of desperation. They were law abiding customers who through financial need have resorted to fraud to keep themselves afl afloat. There might be also inappropriate responses from staff in banks, whether that's the inappropriate foreclosure scandal in the States, or traders mismarking loss-making positions. So you can see how basically an economic shock can change behaviours and lead to more operational risk events, although in some cases fewer. It can also trigger the detection of historical failures. Uh, so Bernie Madoff had been running his Ponzi scheme for about two decades until the global financial crisis hit. 
the losses some of his investors suffered on other investments drove them to ask him for their money back. And when you're running a Ponzi scheme, that's the last thing you want because you run out of cash quite quickly. Um, also, market falls have been the triggers for claims of missed sale on mortgage-backed securities or derivatives. And then when interest rates turned negative, which seems a lifetime ago, uh, a number of firms discovered that some of their structured products didn't contain flaws. It had always been assumed that interest rates would be positive, and that wasn't a, a viable, um, and that wasn't turned out to be the case. And also when a customer defaults, um, you know, um, then there's a possibility that some of the documentation, whether those are nesting agreements or security documentation, will be missing. Uh, and then finally, the scale of an economic shock can exacerbate the severity of operational risk losses. So if you think about in the UK, where interest rate derivatives were missold to small and medium sized enterprises and run up to the financial crisis, um, the level of compensation banks paid was driven by the movement in interest rates from five and a half percent down to half a percent. If we think about it, if rates had only dropped, say, to three percent, the level of compensation payments would have been half the size. So you can see how the severity of an economic move can drive the severity of losses that uh, operational risk losses that firms incur. Uh, Jimmy, if we move on to the next slide. Um, so if you look at the situation that we're actually facing now, um, as a result, as Jimmy said, of uh, COVID and um, the war in Ukraine, so two economic shocks, we're going to see basically peaks in inflation and this, uh, of 13% in 2022, base rates of 3% up to 2024, and unemployment hitting 6.3% in the UK at 2025. And these are the kind of forecasts from the Bank of England's August Monetary Policy Committee. Um, and those are, in some respects, not historically high levels. But I think you've got to look at the context of the last decade that we have, which has been an unusual decade in the extent to which money has almost been free or it's been you know people have paid you to take money because rates have become negative um, and i think that means that a rise in unemployment combined with higher inflation will put more stress on customers uh, than maybe we've seen historically and it also actually means that uh, many regulators and bank staff and customers have no experience of um, stagflation which you know entered our vocabulary during the 1970s. Um, and I think that's an important fact to consider. Um, if we look at some past events, Jimmy, if we just move on to the next slide, um, I've just pulled out two uh, small case studies here of um, two events in, uh, that occurred during my career in terms of sharply rising interest rates. So when UK interest rates rose quite rapidly at the end of the 80s, so we've got um, kind of 75% um, increase in base rates. Um, and similarly, when US dollar rates rose in 1994 quite steeply and unexpectedly. And then on the right hand side, you can see a series of operational risk events that are associated with this. So the Hammersmith and Fulham swap litigation, Kidder Peabody uncovering 350 million of forced PL, Procter and Gamble suing Bankers Trust for misseller derivatives and the collapse of Orange County because of their leveraged head investment fund that they had and litigation they brought against their investment banking advisors. Um, and what I would observe, coming back to my earlier comments, that it is rapid and significant movements in markets that drives operational risk. Um, and coming back to our poll we just had, um, I would say that actually the most significant operational risk losses uh, that firms will suffer will relate to how operational risk interacts with market and credit risk, and that missed sale will be a major contributor, uh, as we can see from these examples. Um, if we move on to the next slide, Jimmy. Um, and then if we look at kind of time horizons, um, so my forecast um, or view of, as to what might happen, uh, and I put on this chart, you know, what will happen in terms of market and also credit risk, because I think the relationship between operational risk and market and credit risk is an important one, um, is that initially uh, we will see uh, potentially operational risk incidents arising, say, from supply defaults, like SunGuard, which went into administration in Q1 of this year. Um, with increased market volatility, you'll see more in the way of fat finger typing losses. Um, but we might actually see a reduction in things like application fraud and processing errors in retail and commercial banks 
because of a tailing off of customer activities. Um, but we may actually see also uh, the re-emergence, say, of rogue trader type events with traders mismarking loss-making positions. Um, what I think though will be the more material losses which will crystallize over a number of years will be potentially uh, staff litigation if banks uh, uh, initiate redundancy programs and there have been some media articles about um, the return of that as a prospect. Um, desperation frauds committed by customers pushed to it by financial need. Um, failing to treat those customers fairly that are in financial difficulties and then the discovery of past issues relating to loan and transaction documentation. And then finally, litigation on historic missed sales. Um, and I think financially, you know, the categories where you've actually got it, where the scale of loss is driven by market and credit risk, like missed sale of investments and products, will be the most significant for us. Um, and then very briefly, I'm just going to cover, because I'm conscious, Jimmy, I'm about to get to my the end of my 10 minutes. Um, what I think people should do about this. Um, so my priority list of things to do would be review loan and transaction documentation, focusing on your higher credit risk customers, carry out stress testing on your critical suppliers, particularly thinking about the length of time it will take you to replace them. Um, undertake more frequent inspections if you're involved in asset finance. So if you are lending based on a physical asset that you own, uh, then validate the existence of that for your less credit worthy customers on a more frequent basis. If you're in the private banking fund management business, review the investment funds that you've sold to customers and think about how they'll perform in these situations. Uh, so you can take early action to advise customers to move uh, and also to stop selling those products if they're vulnerable to a high inflation environment, high interest rate environment. Monitor traders more closely who are approaching their stop loss limits. Uh, and then think about the adequacy of your resourcing uh, for activities such as customer workout and recovery, um, and also any internal headcount reductions. And monitor the activity of professional criminals. Uh, they will be innovative and will respond to the changing circumstances to uh, restore whatever income they've lost from not being able to uh, fraudulently apply for loans and so forth. Um, and then if we just move on to the next slide, Jimmy and I'll wrap up. Um, I mean, this is just the kind of summary of what I've said. I think the key points I will just say is that operational risk is very sensitive, I think, to rapid and significant economic change, which is, I think, what we're exposed to. You may already have baked in some operational risk losses. Some losses may already be unavoidable for past activities. But I think there's still scope to take action now to limit some of the other losses that you might be exposed to. Um, and then um, finally, uh, move on to the last slide, Jimmy. Oh, fine. Um, if you found that content interesting, then chapter 11 of my book is focused on stress testing and exploring how uh, operational risk is sensitive to economic shocks. I think it's possibly the longest chapter in my book. And I think that reflects the complexity of operational risk sensitivity. Um, so anyway, yeah, so if you found it interesting, then, uh, then you'll find the book very helpful. And I think with, with that, Jimmy, I'm, I'm probably done actually. Otherwise, uh, I'll eat into the time of all the others. Available at all good bookshops. So. Um, okay, Jim, over to you. Thanks very much. Well, building directly upon what Michael said, he made a compelling case that operational risk can only rise, or at least the probability, um, in a time of rapid and significant economic change. He also mentioned the factors in terms of the financial markets. But the one thing that I will focus on here is also the expectations in our modern economy and uh, the notion of moving to more of a real-time expectation of our customers. We, we've seen the disruption that will only continue in supply chains uh, risks in terms of physical movements of goods, borders being closed due to the pandemic, energy costs, inability for people to ramp up production or alternatives, 
And one aspect of that has been a, a nearshoring, the, the first time ever in our lifetimes, uh, a movement away from a growing internationalization uh, across borders. And if anything, the political environment is only uh, making that more extreme. So I'm going to focus a little bit more actually on the services industry and in particular the reliance on third-party service providers coming from a background in financial services where there is a rapidly evolving regulatory environment, but something that also has applicability uh, to both service uh, and goods providing industries as we become increasingly dependent on a digital environment. And the one other thing that I'll say in terms of the environment building upon Michael's comments that a lot of entities will be under pressure in this uh, economic headwinds and a volatile environment. We've already seen in the past six months that those entities that are most under financial pressure are the innovative growth companies that are supporting this digital transformation. So those in some ways can be uh, among the most vulnerable of the service providers. Next slide, Jimmy. So what I'm, I'm going to do very quickly is bring together two themes that I think are merging. And this is really my thesis that a lot of what we all know well in terms of ex ante approaches to risk management, looking at our, our counterparties, looking at the supply chain for goods or for services is increasingly compressed and our ability to act, including to turn on our business continuity measures, is a function of the information flow that we've received. And again, to make a, a, a difference here, if we're talking about a factory that is relying on certain service parts, it's pretty obvious whether those parts have arrived or not. And there's even silly examples, one from two days ago that Ford Motor Company was not delivering its high value, high profit new trucks because it didn't have the stickers for the logo to finish them, something that does not have a critical operational component. But if you're in the service industry, you might not even know about an operational disruption. You might be getting fewer customer complaints because your out service line that they're calling um, is not available. And you don't even know that the consumers are not able to access some of your, your portals. How do you address that? How do you address that operational risk? You need to have a framework in place for appropriate information sharing through the entire service party chain. Next slide, please. And just building uh, upon the regulatory notions here from the EU, but the same standards are being adopted in terms of global principles. Outsourcing traditionally has meant the notion that a decision is made to pay another service provider rather than provide the service yourself. With the digital environment, particular cloud services, it's no longer an option. It's not comparable. You cannot compete as yourself, as an individual organization. So the very notion of the third party questions that we have are, again, becoming broader and broader across the, the spectrum. And although from the, the poll, I note very few people or a lower percentage mentioned regulatory issues, Regulatory issues are coming to a bear, uh, particularly on data service providers. Next slide, please. So when we talk about the traditional outsourcing framework, this one, um, the one aspect that can sum up all of the issues is essentially control. Coming back to that definition of outsourcing, something that 
you might have done yourself, but now you're relying on others. In many cases, multiple others. The very transition that has been increasingly common to move from an on-premise installation of software where you're reliant on that software programming entity that's licensing the software to you to a, a cloud-based installation moves from one to a range of different service providers, any one of which the failure can disrupt your operations. And the other aspect that is interesting when you do your evaluation of that operational risk is the very notion of jurisdictional differences. It comes back to the, the point I made at the beginning in terms of de-internationalization. The fact that data is held in another jurisdiction under a different confidentiality or data protection environment, or your contractual remedies are different, or there's a different political environment is a risk criteria that you need to take into consideration because it's a different way of saying you're lacking control. Next slide, please. And particularly as we, we get to data uh, cloud service providers, the very question of jurisdictions and where the data is, is something that's, that's hard to answer. Um, and even when the attempts are uh, put together to try to have limited clouds, that they are something that, that is uh, increasingly uh, uh, an important gray area for us. I take this slide that I've amended a little bit from the financial industry, both from an EU perspective or from a US regulatory perspective in terms of outsourcing risk management, the operational risk management being a life cycle, things that we know very well in terms of the planning, the due diligence, the contractual aspects. Um, through post-engagement side, but really this ongoing and monitoring is the aspect that is increasingly important because of this real-time focus. In practice, if you set up a policy and procedures whereby on a periodic basis, you do a routine review of the due diligence of your external service service providers, let's say on a yearly basis, this so much can change over a 12 month period. And this is increasingly the, the challenge. How do we get ahead of this? How do we know even the changes with respect to their underlying service providers, subcontracting, fourth party relationships? Um, and again, building upon Michael's points in this increasingly challenging economic environment, things will happen even sooner and have that repercussions up the chain. Jimmy, next slide. I just wanted to say quickly something about uh, cyber security because that I anticipated was the, the biggest issue that came up from the, the audience and a lot of regulatory frameworks, particularly tying this risk management to incident reporting is tied to cybersecurity. And again, to consider what we're trying to avoid, we're trying to avoid the situation that you may have had data with your service provider and you only find out six months later that there was an attack on that service provider and through that confidential information was disclose. There's too many instances of that. But the problem that I have, and one thing that I urge you to be very careful with, especially when we talk about the issue with third-party service providers or down the outsourcing chain, is that cybersecurity is a cause of the operational risk. But from your perspective, as someone relying on third-party service providers, you don't really care what that cause is. Meaning that whether it's a fat finger, whether it's the, the human error, whether it's uh, an aspect because of the challenging economic services that 
uh, company is no longer viable, whether it's a result of fraud, whether it's a result of unique incident in, in nature that are increasing from 100 year storms to annual storms, the failure of your service provider creates the operational risk effect for you. And many of the notification requirements that allow would allow you to act um, and move forward with your business continuity are narrowly defined to this question of cybersecurity. You may only know much later that the, re the operational incident that affected you was caused by a cybersecurity incident. Be wary uh, about limiting your reporting in that regard. Last point, and exactly these uh, provisions are part of the EU's Digital Operational Resilience Act broadly defined across the financial sector, but also for the first time setting up a harmonized framework and oversight of the cloud service providers. And it's exactly these points of ongoing risk management, including incident reporting and information sharing that are one of the biggest changes. And I think it's a very good thing that in that document itself, in the, the regulation, it has emphasized changes in contractual arrangements. And that's one of the tips that I'm giving you that regardless of your policies in terms of risk management and review, unless there's an obligation upon parties to give you real-time information, you won't be able to act in a way that you need. That finishes me up, Jimmy. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Jim. Certainly, we're seeing a huge focus globally and including in the UK on this whole issue of third uh, party vendor risk management, including through the focus on operational resilience, which we might get onto in the, in the Q and A. Okay, so let me now hand over to uh, Thomas for your uh, presentation. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jimmy. I thought it might be interesting to broaden the scope a little bit and not only look at operational risk in a broader sense, but also to non-financial risk in a, um, in a broader sense. And if you move to the next page, please. Um, then I see this as a sort of catalyst, which transforms uh, one risk type uh, into another one. And uh, quite often operation risk is the trigger for um, reputation risk. And from reputation risk, as you all know, you can have especially business and liquidity risk and sometimes even another operation risk. And I think my colleagues mentioned at least two things which are important to reputation risks. Uh, Michael talked about stakeholders. Uh, which is a very um, key concept uh, to reputation risk, uh, that you have a variety of stakeholders you have to deal with, and they have, and that's the, the next key term which has been mentioned by Jim, which have differing expectations. Uh, and if you don't meet the expectations of your stakeholders, then you typically run into a reputational risk. Um, so the next page. Uh, let's look at some examples uh, which you can expect. And of course, uh, there will be many more. Um, and um, I'm a strong believer that reputation risk both can be triggered by other risk types and also can be a risk type of its own. Um, so for instance, uh, the way how you deal with corporate clients in distress, for instance, if you have energy intensive industries, uh, which need additional funding and which business model is, is suffering um, that um, not only has a credit risk perspective to it, but also a reputation risk perspective, similarly like how to deal with retail customers, which are hit by inflation uh, and now are struggling. Um, are you uh, treating them in a fair way um, or not? expectation also from the outside. I mentioned shareholders and regulators. You could also add governance if you looked at uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and how much expectations uh, various governments have put on banks, um, how to deal uh, with both their retail and their corporate clients. Uh, that's again um, a re potential reputation risk. Uh, you can run into, and if you look further, uh, banks might want to further, um, yeah, basically uh, decrease their cost base, for instance, by additional layoffs, where again, of course, you will have stakeholders, for instance, of course, especially employees um, who will protest against that. 
and also things which have been mentioned by Jim, for example, I think he spoke about supply chain issues, uh, which of course can also hit banks uh, if whatever you are no longer able to maintain your backup uh, power generators uh, because spare parts are missing and you have a power outage uh, and can't compensate for that, uh, that might hit you and your operations and might uh, affect your reputation. And also if you think about uh, the requirements various governments have now put on corporations that they save energy, uh, for instance, by reducing temperature uh, in office buildings or by reducing lighting, uh, that also might have reputational risk impact. So on the next slide, what can we do about that? Uh, so typically you can't get away from reputation risk completely, especially because you have so many stakeholders involved. Um, so I talk about the topic a lot and I always offered some reward to participants who provide me with an example of any business decision which does not at least uh, impact one stakeholder in a negative way. Uh, the way you don't get a reputation risk uh, effect uh, from at least one stakeholder. So you should anticipate stakeholder reactions and uh, how severe they might get. Uh, that's uh, very important um, so that you can uh, respond to that. You have to address uh, stakeholders individually. Uh, you might have experienced that yourself, uh, that you read things uh, in the press uh, which affect you uh, personally. Just a very small example. I learned uh, from uh, the press uh, that uh, Goethe University is going to shut down uh, operations for two more days during uh, winter time. Um, and uh, this has not been communicated to anybody at university as it affects my teaching schedule. Uh, I read it uh, in the newspaper. And you have that in banks and other corporations as well, of course. And don't forget about the causal events. Of course, if you uh, can get rid of operation risk events, for instance, uh, would trigger reputation risk, that's of course, uh, the silver bullet because uh, it spares you dealing uh, with reputation risk in the end. And don't forget, it's not just about words. Um, so if you don't really fight the underlying problems and things repeat, um, then it will be much more difficult um, to uh, deal with reputation risk events because stakeholders simply won't believe you um, any longer. Um, and um, also look at in the future, I probably would talk about that uh, in the um, panel discussion later on. Uh, I think ESG risk is a very big topic. I saw in the chat that uh, there was already a question from somebody in the audience on that very topic. Um, so if you looked at how banks dealt with COVID-19, uh, I think that's a bit of a blueprint how to deal uh, with ESG. Um, because basically a lot of those effects happened in a very short period of time uh, and banks and other um, participants uh, in the industry had to deal with that. So um, on the next page, uh, if you want to read a little bit more about that, um, I think Michael already mentioned his books. Uh, I also published a few books. Uh, the latest one is one on non-financial risk management. There is one chapter on reputation risk in particular. Uh, there's chapters on uh, cyber risk and, and other uh, important parts of operation risk. Uh, have a look at that. You can even get a 25% discount uh, with a code uh, which is shown on the slide. And I edited a book uh, together with a colleague from uh, Unicredit Bank um, on reputation risk in particular. Um, it's a few years old already, but I would say it's still worthwhile reading. So thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Thomas. And now, finally, last but not least, Dominic, over to you. Oh, thank you. Um, today, um, actually, I would like to bring up a topic um, called um, Agile Risk Management. Um, I think it's very timely, uh, especially if you look at, you know, what happened right now in the capital market, there's only one word, you know, can describe it all, right? It's volatility. It's actually things change very rapidly that you might not, you know, expect it uh, actually can happen, right? So next night, please. Okay, next night, please. 
Um, actually, um, when I talk to my boss, right, uh, you know, the, the CEO or the business leaders, um, they always tell me that, you know, time is money, okay? They need to react very quickly so that, you know, they can time the market, you know, before the other competitors. They also need to react very rapidly in front of, you know, uh, unexpected incident, okay, or disruption, right? They also need, you know, to act very rapidly in order to, uh, you know, adapt, you know, our, our organization changes so that, and also, you know, um, I would say the, uh, uh, you know, roll out our culture, you know, et cetera, right? I think more important is, you know, the world is very complex, okay? So they need, you know, to handle very, you know, complex uh, problem, okay? And they need, you know, sometimes uh, the, um, you know, say the solution, right? To be very quick, or sometimes you can call it, you know, a quick week, okay? Rather than, you know, waiting for a long time before you can deliver the ultimate uh, I mean, solution. Yeah. Next slide, please. Now, so um, when we're talking about business um, agility, right? There are actually many tools, right? So the people might uh, tell you that, you know, you need to identify what the critical drivers, okay? Uh, you need to handle, you know, uh, different uh, uh, scenarios of uh, complexity, okay? And uh, more important is uh, business agility, right? It's a link with what we call, you know, uh, value, you know, discovery, you know, how uh, value, uh, value validation, and more important is how to deliver value uh, to the stakeholders, okay? So uh, actually below that, you see all the different, you know, uh, games or tools, toolkits, you know, that you can use, right? Next slide, please. I'll give you some examples of application, right? So um, I think it's really nowadays, uh, this year, um, we anticipate, you know, um, there might be a possible recession uh, coming, okay? So all the company, you know, now need to reflect this in their budgeting right now, okay? Actually for next year, right? So they may actually talk about cost containment, you know, maybe start redundancy, you know, so as to actually still, you know, can be survived in the market, okay? Well, on the other hand, you know, they explore opportunity, you know, that um, maybe, for example, new uh, client segment, uh, new old thing, you know, the kind of uh, what we call the reset generation. Actually, there may be, you know, some kind of a, a business opportunity, okay? And um, we need to, you know, uh, uh, implement new marketing campaigns so that we have to catch up with our competitors. I think you might hear that now they already enter into the metaverse space, okay? And uh, begin, you know, to solicit customer. Are we still, you know, just... Uh, 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 staying what we are doing now, or actually we need to rush into the metaverse, maybe tomorrow, okay? They talk about adopting new technology, okay? So there are pieces of a digital transformation. We are talking about, you know, how to, uh, for example, in case of a major disaster, we use a team, you know, to enforce this. I, I don't know, but um, today I think you might read the news that, that there's an asteroid, you know, uh, coming to the earth. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then the last uh, actually is uh, planning, you know, how to <laughs> uh, actually change, you know, the, the routine path of the astronaut so that, you know, it won't hit the earth. Otherwise, it's the end of the world, okay? So things, something like that, unexpected, you know, but it can happen, right? Okay. And then we talk about um, agile risk management. Uh, actually, we need to, you know, um, optimize our budget to identify potential financial risk, total risk, you know, also identify process deliver organization risk, as well as you know, um, using AI to identify all kinds of, all kinds of risks more instantly, right? And then we also make use of other tools, you know, uh, actually to identify maybe processing risk. So all the thing that I talk about, right, is how can risk management be a dynamic activity that's embraced by stakeholder? Okay, next slide, please. Right, so uh, when we practice, uh, you know, agile risk management, we need to be, um, you know, um, adopting a new thinking, okay? Is to provide timely risk management services to the stakeholder, including the board, you know, the committee. And actually, in most of okay, just now, you know, you run a technology uh, project, right? You need to split, you know, the, place, the, the whole project into different pieces. Risk management also need to do the same. Right? Rather than you perform only the risk assessment, from beginning to the end, you may actually need to step in and only perform risk assessment for a particular phase. And then you move on to do another risk assessment for another project, okay? And then here we talk about circle keyword, right? Engaging, you know, the key, uh, um, especially the frontline people, okay? Uh, collaborate, you know, with them, okay? 
we need to be dynamic. We no longer, you know, can be just a, you know, stay behind, right? And watch. You need to be going into the field to play the game as well. We need to be make ourselves rapidly, you know, adapt, you know, to the changing environment. We need to produce timely risk report. And to be honest, right? You can't just produce a report, say, uh, once a quarter, okay, or once a month. Sometimes think about to produce the risk report in the next five, 15 minutes. So have the management to make decision. And I can tell you in some, uh, for example, technology company, they make decision in minutes, okay, rather than in days or week, okay? Uh, think about more, more proactively about what's the early warning signal, okay? It's actually talking about new way of working, right? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, give an example. If you run the project, right? Okay, maybe a, a major system rollout. You talk about the freelance of defense, right? So the first time, I mean, they'll do all the, uh, the uh, UAT, the testing, we got assurance. And there's, uh, the role of the risk management, right? Is actually to monitor that what the business are doing actually within the parameters, you know, defined in the um, the project charter, okay? And also ensure that, you know, they don't um, you know, identify the risk you know, that may be, uh, we realize actually exceed our risk appetite, right? So it talked about the role of the internal audit, et cetera, right? So the whole value of, you know, for risk management to be more, you know, stay close to the project actually is to ensure that we can deliver, you know, our project, you know, timely and also more important is to deliver value uh, to our customer and also practice more, you know, risk management rather than, you know, risk management only, you know, coming in very late in the, a part of the project, and then you tell me that something goes wrong. Actually, we don't have the time to fix it, okay? Yeah, please. So here is the illustration, right? So um, if you look at the middle one, the middle line, okay? If the, there is actually um, a market opportunity, right? So we need to define, for example, uh, what the type of new products or service we can offer, and then, you know, uh, define what the performance requirement, you know, identify the impact loss, et cetera, right? So um, on the top, you can see that how risk actually interact with them, right? So immediately we think we have to, you know, judge whether it's within our risk appetite. For example, um, do we need to establish some kind of a standard and uh, policy? Actually, what is the inherent risk involved? You know, uh, is there actually greater than the appetite? We provide instant feedback to the business so that, you know, they can make adjustment, right, right, right? Rather than they move on to the next stage. And you can see that, right? Uh, for the middle row, actually continue, okay? And then uh, finally, give you a case study, right? So this is actually from a lot of bank. They uh, actually implement a very big system uh, involving about 680 uh, employees. So for their project, they actually uh, implement an agile style. And also for risk management, it's very interact with the project team. They also implement this uh, with, uh, I would say, agile management, actually doing risk assessment, you know, piece by piece. And at the end of the day, they can deliver the objective, right? So um, I, I think especially in life during these uh, uh, times of uncertainty, um, add and think rapidly is most important. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Dominic. Um, so that's uh, great. So we managed to get through the four presentations in pretty good uh, time. So we've got a good uh, 30 minutes, 35 minutes uh, for the Q&A. And I can see that we've already had some good questions coming in, which is really excellent. But I think maybe we start off by just pulling it back to the central theme of the webinar and I, I when I used to work at the regulator the classic question you would always ask at the end of the meeting with the CRO or the the CEO was what are the risks that keep you awake at night um so maybe I can ask each of you what are the risks that will be keeping you awake at night in terms of the economic headwinds and maybe if we start off with uh with Thomas I would say it's probably not just the one single risk uh, which should be looked at, but I think it's rather the um, combination of risks and also the, the effect that um, risks tend to uh, basically ac accelerate each other. And uh, as I said in, in one of my slides, it's a bit of a catalyst um, kind of thing. And I think that's what's currently happening that you have more and more risks, uh, which increase the interconnectedness of risk types like ESG risk, uh, like step-in risk, like reputational risk. Um, so it's no longer reasonable from my perspective to manage 
risks individually, unless you're really sure that they are independent uh, of each other, but, but rather that you have to look at things in combination. Jim, have any, any thoughts on that? I'll just um, build on that theme that if we think there's an array of risks and the interconnectedness, then consider that we've determined that one of our risks is the reliance on an external service provider or a service provider chain. Each of those entities has the same array. So you see a social mapping aspect of galaxies of risk that all build up. And you can never get yourself fully on top of that or anticipate in particular the correlation across those entities. So th let's give one concrete example there. If you rely on a certain service provider and then as part of your business continuity, you have a backup provider, but they in turn rely on the same service provider. Let's say the network to um, even uh, bring the data into the cloud without the, the cloud service provider. Then when that node goes down, both your primary and your backup are down. If you don't know that, you haven't done good op risk planning. Certainly a big challenge. <laughs> Michael, any thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to actually echo what um, Thomas said actually about the interconnectivity of the different risks and that uh, whether you work in market risk or credit risk or operational risk or liquidity risk, you can't sit in a silo. Um, I mean, one of the, I guess, observations I make about the war in Ukraine is that if I think over like a two or three month period, um, you know, there was almost like a sort of domino effect of different risks that were being impacted, whether that was uh, sanctions, whether it was essentially market risk because uh, counterparties had become sanctions and so um, trades would get cancelled. Um, or whether it became credit risk, or then when it moved on to um, you know, vendors that were starting to be impacted as well. Um, it's the interconnectivity. Um, and I think the challenge that pre presents to the risk management department is the extent to which you know, often we've you know, uh, worked for extended periods of our careers in our own particular silo. Um, and that's fine in the good times, and it's not when you've got these kinds of uh, economic shocks or external crises. Just building on that, uh, Michael, it's just interesting. You obviously did a huge amount of work looking at the GFC, uh, the last, uh, I guess, major mm -hmm. economic downturn following that. What would you say were some of the key things that have changed since that time? If you look at things like, um, I guess, you know, the, the expectations of uh, regulators, of uh, consumers, particularly thinking about new demographics having now entered into the marketplace, much higher expectations on what kind of a service they get from, uh, you know, from their, um, from their providers. The changes around the complexity, uh, Jim talked about this galaxy of uh, risks. I, I think that definitely has become more so since uh, the GFC. And then this whole thing around reputational risk, bringing it back to Thomas's presentation around, you know, we now very much live in this social media age where incidents can very quickly go viral. So you have this immense, uh, immensely fast velocity of impact of reputational harms on firms. How, how would you consider all those different things in terms of impacting the picture that you're setting? So that's quite a broad question, Jimmy. <laughs> so we've got half an hour left. Let's see if I can answer that. Um, I mean, I think time will actually tell. Um, if you look back at some of the um, you know large losses that firms suffered during the global financial crisis, um, whether that was the missale of PPI, the missale of mortgage-backed securities and CDOs, or whether it was uh, manipulation of um, benchmarks uh, and pricing around FX and other commodities. Um, I, I don't know, it, it, it's almost like you think, well, um, you know, 
surely actually through a combination of lessons learned and regulatory focus, you would hope that um, these types of issues would be much smaller this time around, or actually I left out kind of inappropriate foreclosure and treating customers fairly in financial difficulties. Um, I guess one of the observations is that, you know, over the years, you know, financial services and banking have had a series of crises. Um, it's a fairly cyclical industry, um, which kind of begs the question as to how well we actually learn lessons or whether actually the turnover of staff means another generation of bankers learn the same lessons again. Um, time will tell. I hope it will be a more positive outcome than the global financial crisis was. Um, I think with um, reputational risk, um, I would um, again agree with Thomas that um, I would see um, reputational risk as being uh, a consequence, not just of operational risk, but also of market and credit risk uh, events that firms suffer can damage your reputation. Um, I would also see it as being a risk in its own right. Um, so um, you know, that may be down to either decisions that firms make in terms of the types of customers and types of business that they do. Um, or I think also, particularly with climate change, um, we've talked about um, you know, expectations. You know, I think you know, reputational damage is when you have a perception gap between what your stakeholders expect and how they perceive you. Um, and normally what happens is you have reputational damage because you've done something wrong. So their perception of you has declined. You know, you, you've had a horrible event or you've had an outage. Um, I think with things like climate change, we may find that you know, firms are continuing to do what they've always done, but the expectations of their stakeholders have changed. So the, the negative perception is not because you've done anything differently. The negative perception is because you haven't done anything differently and they want you to. Um, and I think that will be quite interesting going forward. I think um, in, in an article I wrote, which um, is um, going through the process of being published, I kind of drew a comparison actually between climate change potentially and um, for those of us with long memories, the campaigns against some British banks relating to their investment in South Africa during the apartheid era. And those banks have been invested in South Africa for probably a century or more. <laughs> they weren't doing anything differently, but the expectations of their stakeholders changed and there was a reputational damage and a financial consequence for them as a result. Jimmy, may I just add to that? Of course, yeah. Um, I think one thing a lot of people don't recognize in respect uh, to reputation risk is that the order of magnitude is quite often irrelevant. Uh, so in financial risk, you, of course, uh, look at your exposure, um, and the smaller your exposure is, um, typically, the less you worry about that. Uh, a lot of stakeholders uh, don't differentiate. Um, so you saw that in, in quite a few examples, like... Uh, take a non-bank uh, example, the Siemens uh, issue in Australia uh, was delivering some uh, railway uh, systems uh, to a mining company uh, where I think they claimed that it's only a, a just a tiny fraction of their overall revenue, um, and uh, which didn't help them at all in managing uh, that issue uh, because that even more so is basically the um, gives um, stakeholders uh, the the uh, the edge to say well if, if it's not important to you why do you do it at all then and, and then that's i think uh, the problem and, and that is also true with esg in general uh, if if you do a little bit bad things uh, so to speak um, that might harm you tremendously in the reputation risk space. Uh, yeah, Can Tom, I, I, I think that's yeah. very true, actually, because I think um, in 1986, when Barclays did finally um, divest from South Africa by allowing their um, subsidiary, uh, which was listed for a rights issue, to dilute them below 50%, the contribution to their revenues for the year for 1986 from South Africa was only £13 million. Pounds which was fractional in terms of Barclays total revenues, but the consequence was quite disproportionate in terms of um, the profile of the campaigns against them. Jimmy, you wanted to come in, I think. Exactly, just building, because I think this is uh, very useful and it's responsive to one of the questions that came in about 
climate transition risk. And I, I agree as, as Thomas and Michael were saying, there's a difference between the reputational aspect and I'll call it to oversimplify here, the direct financial impact. And particularly the question was from a bank's perspective, that's obviously very different from an energy producer perspective. One way that I think is very useful for us to consider it within our operational risk framework is not on the individual E environmental component or even the ESG, but it's the sustainability aspect. If your concern is the long-term sustainability of the, the company, the revenue streams, um, that's different from a short-term issue. So to just give you very clear differentiation of example there, in the past months, a loan from a bank short term to a petroleum producer was very good. Equity was even better because of the way gas prices uh, shot up. A lot of people view that negatively from a reputational aspect, but that's a, a value judgment, not the short-term economic risk. That being said, committing a long-term portfolio approach or investment into petroleum or, or dirty energy as opposed to clean energy does have more open questions in terms of the sustainability and how in a changing environment that value uh, might develop in a period that could be decades. And right. just to add another thing to that, um, you're completely right um, that you have to think in, in longer term dimensions. Uh, but if you look at how quickly public opinion and also expectation from, from relevant stakeholders like governments uh, changes, for instance, triggered by the uh, war in Ukraine, uh, that uh, a company producing weapons uh, used to be on um, the blacklist of a lot of banks uh, and now they seem to become uh, something uh, which uh, is, is in high demand. Uh, so it's very difficult, I think, to adjust uh, your, your strategy and your policies uh, to very uh, quickly changing uh, things. The same as was uh, the discussion on, on nuclear power or uh, now the, um, the gas issue with importing uh, gas from other countries. We've had uh, ESG mentioned a few times predictably. Anyone else would like to say anything more on, we've got a question in, in terms of the ability to measure ESG risk. That's probably a whole day's uh, conference. But um, any, any thoughts? Uh, I mean, I think it's, um, I think trying to quantify the impact of, um, well, I think ESG is too broad, but let's say just climate change. Um, I think really, um, you obviously have to look at the variety of different scenarios that are being proposed, whether that's early action during the 2020s or late action in the 2030s or no additional action, um, and look at how operational risk will behave in response to the different severities of economic shock. Um, and I think when I've looked at this, you know, if we take action on climate change in the 2020s, you know, the impact on operational risk is quite marginal. If you look at, at the late action climate change scenario, which involves an economic trauma on a par with a global financial crisis, then I would say that will lead to significant conduct related losses, unless, you know, as, as we were saying earlier, you know, we've really uh, addressed some of the historic issues. But by that point, it's almost a generation in terms of bankers since the global financial crisis. Um, and if you get to the no additional action scenario, then it's both economically unstable and environmentally unstable as well. And that seems a very unpleasant world to be in. Anyone else, any thoughts on, uh, on ESG? Yeah, I think the scenario is, of course, a very important component. I think in the beginning of the discussions on ESG, there was quite a lot of focus on, let's say, the classical quantitative model, especially in credit risk, uh, to fine-tune basically your ratings uh, approach and so forth. 
uh, which has its value, no doubt about that. Uh, but I think if you look at the bigger picture, you have to think in scenarios, you have to rely on expert opinion. You also have to deal with the fact um, that a lot of the effects are very long term and are basically very difficult to align with uh, the traditional thinking uh, in risk management, which is it's, it's about a year's time horizon uh, typically. The last comment that I'll, I'll make is that um, I focus a lot on the G component. Obviously, the E is the one that has the, the most public focus and a lot of work in terms of nomenclature, standards, re reporting. S is um, different in some ways, uh, oversimplified. But what we're talking about, even if it's the framework, how you deal with the aspects of the environmental side or the S, is really a part of the governance. Governance is sometimes uh, oversimplified in terms of diversity of board members. Uh, that's something that I can tell you is an aspect that uh, is doomed to fail. So uh, definitely if you are uh, promoting uh, your operational risk and environment and make sure people understand how critical that is to, again, your long-term sustainability, and that is part of the governance component of ESG. Yeah, maybe um, I can add on a little bit, right? Um, if talk about the climate transition risk, right? I think we understand that, you know, um, uh, for some uh, industries or for some, you know, uh, kind segment, uh, they might actually, uh, you know, some of them may be severely affected or eventually, you know, uh, I would say uh, astonished, right? So that's why I think from an operation risk perspective, when we actually onboard a new client, when we actually ask uh, to do a due diligence on the client, really to actually, uh, you know, uh, consider the, uh, all the scenario and ask the, all the right questions and collect all the information. I think also, you know, when we deploy you know, the new product or new services, also ensure that, you know, we actually uh, consider all the ESG component, right? So, um, you know, without doing that, you know, um, there may be a chance that you actually um, we onboard, a, not a, for example, a, a kind that lost suitable for that product. Actually, I think we're selling some government selling risk, or maybe we lend money or investing in them, actually causing, you know, financial you know, exposure uh, to our financial institutions. Yeah. Great. Thanks, uh, Dominic. Uh, so let's uh, see if we can get through some more of the questions that have come in. Uh, Stephen Murgatroyd, very good to see you, uh, very great a servant to the IOR over the years. Um, and uh, you've asked a question uh, to uh, to Jim, but I think we can maybe open it to, to anyone who has a view, just in terms of the view of deliberate redundancy as a risk treatment. Uh, and I guess this is interesting in terms of, you know, this is one of the key drivers of regulators around operational resilience, so having that spare capacity. Uh, to be able to um, absorb operational disruption and continue to provide that service to consumers. Maybe the economic headwinds will make that even more difficult for firms to do as they're trying to cut costs. Um, any thoughts on that uh, general question from, from, from Stephen? Absolutely. So clearly redundancy is one of our options for risk mitigation. As Jimmy said, it comes with cost so it needs to be a risk-based decisions it's not in an absolute that it's always the the right answer or what level it's the right answer but what i can advise particularly uh, upon my theme today in terms of service providers the operational redundancy with different service providers as compared to different operation centers that you operate to to hot sites with uh, appropriate staff and the like will potentially have different risks. So, so let's just take the aspect of different cloud providers. You could say that, well, if I have my data in one versus the other, fine, it shouldn't be very different. That's true in terms of long-term storage, which is cheap, but in terms of operational aspects, even if you're running the same software, the different cloud providers have different analytics. So the way that you monitor those operations will differ. So you have to really take that into consideration. And that's, of course, also separate from the other types of trade-offs you have, such as 
the speed of light, how close the, the sites are if you're trying to run up mirroring operations and the like. The, the very aspect of different service providers down the chain can have different offerings and different limitations needs to be factored into your redundancy decision. It's interesting, one of the, I think one of the trends post um, the pandemic, and there was a lot of talk about it at the time, was around bringing back those supply chains, having less uh, concentration risk, bringing back um, production domestically. Do you think that's going to be a trend that will continue for, for large organizations to start maybe bringing back um, um, things that have been previously outsourced in-house where possible? So I'm not sure that it's possible to bring things back in the house, but to, uh, again, particularly in the, the data side, these are economies of scale aspects. So there's very few organizations that it makes sense. Even if you're a car manufacturer with electric vehicles that are much more software dependent than ever before, they're, they're struggling with that transformation. So the notion of increasing reliance on external providers will only grow it's just a question for some it might grow faster than for others mm. but but i do think that's distinct from the point that you made in terms of nearshoring domestic reliance yeah. if anything that aspect is being driven by regulatory concerns and also the realities of the political environment Great. So we've got another question just come in. Um, where do you think our colleagues in internal audit should be providing risk assurance to the board during this period of economic instability? We'd like to have a go at that one. <laughs> hey, <Jimmy. laughs> Um, the only thing I was going to add to this is that um, my, my observations, um, probably based on some of the previous banks I've worked for, is that the internal audit process of doing audits can be um, you know, a very systematic and a very extended kind of process. Um, and I think in the same way that um, we were talking earlier about agile approaches to risk management. The thing I would advocate here is that there probably needs to be a more agile approach to internal audit um, to maybe carry out reviews that are much quicker and much more targeted and you know, maybe you know, don't have the same you know, rigor and extended process that the kind of standard internal audit processes are. Because I think in a dynamic and changing environment, then agility, I think, is key. Hmm. And presumably one bit of advice for audit functions would actually be to, you know, make sure that you almost get back to focusing on the basics. So looking at the operational risk framework, the key tools, how are they operating? You know, we've had this period of, uh, of COVID where we had a huge amount of change and disruption, almost you know, two years really. Mm -hmm. of a permanent disruption where we had almost overnight a move to almost fully remote working will take time for controls to adjust to that controls to be put in place a lot of firms maybe dropped uh, or deferred doing things like rcsa because of the disruption so almost kind of getting back to a, a kind of a steady state in terms of the the, the the kind of the core elements of operational risk management yeah, I mean, the only thing I might say, Jim, is, uh, again, it, it, you know, if the question is kind of focused on in, internal audit, um, again, probably every firm I've worked for has had a process of agreeing annually a plan of work to be conducted. Um, you know, many um, institutions who probably dialed into this, certainly for um, the UK, for Europe, for North America, typically have financial years that are kind of calendar years. Um, you know, the Japanese firms, the Australian firms have sometimes have slight, they have different, uh, calendar, uh, different financial years. Um, so it means that probably many of the firms that have dialed into this call, their internal audit functions would have established what their plan was for 2022, probably during the fourth quarter of 2021. Um, and it's a very different environment that we're in now. Um, and I think, you know, and I'm sure many firms have, have basically have revisited or are revisiting those plans. Um, 
and what they're kind of focusing on. Um, and I think that's a combination of where you see currently that you would have um, heightened areas of risk and then looking forward as to where in 2023 and 2024 you're going to have heightened area of risk and targeting that. I'll add one one other aspect because it's focused the question on internal audit and the, the board. A lot of this is a, a question about risk acceptance. And so first awareness raising, but it, especially economic instability, there's not always that much that a company can do in terms of risk mitigation in that regard or risk transfer through an insurance or the like. So uh, risk acceptance is an important aspect and, and sometimes boards don't wanna hear that. They wanna hear that everything's okay. We've got all the measures in place. We, we have the continuity uh, aspects, but we know the best of our plans and that again, I keep coming back to the aspect of incidents. It, it's only a question of probability. Disruptions will happen. We try to limit that and, and limit the negative repercussions through, through planning, but disruptions will happen. I fully agree uh, with uh, what you're saying. And I think in addition to risk acceptance, I would also would urge uh, companies to really update their risk appetite and, and risk strategy uh, in, in case of, of disruptions. Uh, not just accepting basically for a longer period of time that you have all sorts of limit breaches, uh, not necessarily in, in financial risk only, uh, but also uh, being agile about that and, and thinking about how do we have to adjust our limits, which can also be qualitative, of course, uh, to reflect uh, the change situation. We've got a question here around risk acceptance. What level of rigor and governance should be applied to risk to be accepted? And a big, uh, big question. I'm not so easy. Sure, you could say that in no. the absolute, but the, the first aspect is risk identification and prioritization, of course. And uh, materiality aspects are one of the most important things in terms of governance, identifying, prioritizing, and from that, you will see what should be focused on. It's it's not helpful when we just uh, go more and more and apply the same methodology to every business line or every risk or every service provider relationship, but focus on those that are most critical That and those are the ones should have a higher level of rigor. And uh, again, uh, an awareness and, and monitoring and reviewing to, to the point that Thomas uh, said, just because one was considered critical before or risk tolerance with respect to them was critical before, that, that needs to be revised probably on more close to an ongoing basis than has been done in the past due to the volatility in the environment. Uh, can I also add uh, one more point about this uh, question, right? Uh, actually, also relating to agile risk management, um, you know, there's a, a tool called a risk burn down, okay? Actually, uh, meaning that, you know, um, as time goes by, right, you know, some residual risk, you know, will eventually diminish or eventually go away, right? So I think, you know, um, when we, you know, try to uh, uh, crystallize the risk and then you present to the management whether they would like to accept the risk, please also consider uh, what is the future development of this risk rather than just to take a snapshot for the time being? Okay, great. So time is uh, flowing very quickly. I think in the last five minutes, it would be good just to get your final uh, thoughts and maybe to answer one question. So if you were sitting down uh, for a pint of beer with uh, the head of op risk in a, in a particular bank and you had to give them one piece of advice as to what they should be doing now, what would it be? Uh, maybe if we start with you, uh, Michael. Uh, I think, Jimmy, I, I would say for them to actually act now in terms of trying to mitigate operational risks that probably wouldn't otherwise crystallise for two or three years. But it's, um, it's looking forward as to what the outcomes are of an economic shock and how those drive operational risks and acting now to the extent we can to try and mitigate that. Right. Dominic? Um, to be frank, right, 
um, I think most of the financial institutions already have established their own uh, risk management framework, all the tools in place, and also been uh, audited by both internal and external audit and also regulator, right? So I think to me, especially in the uh, time of this world uncertainty, more important is improving our risk decision quality, okay? And uh, this is actually based on how can we minimize the risk biases? I think um, there's, I, I do see many, you know, uh, um, cases that we make bad decisions, okay? Based on, you know, assumption that history will repeat in the future, okay? Based on, you know, just uh, following what the group is thinking, uh, you know, just, you know, going uh, the most easy path, what that then, you know, going into a deep dive analysis with all these uh, quantitative stuff, right? Of course, Agile, agility is very important, right? We need to, you know, uh, time to the market um, because decision actually change the future. Yeah. Dominic, just on that, do you think that the industry in general is in a better position now than it was at the last I, GFC in terms of the quality of frameworks and tools? Uh, I think the, uh, most of banks, you know, have all the framework we actually learned from uh, uh, global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. But to be frank, uh, this year, we do see many, what we call the black swan that we don't expect, okay? And I can uh, tell you, I can, I can predict, right? There will be more best one actually coming. For example, <laughs> and you, uh, I, I don't you know, scare anyone, but you talk about possible a uh, nuclear war, okay? You know, a possible, a major, you know, multinational company bankrupt tom uh, tomorrow, okay? All this kind of, you know, like start petition, which is uh, chickening point, something like that, right? So we need to be, you know, thinking out of the box rather than, just based on what we have on hand and just, you know, uh, I think we need to leave a comfort zone. I mean, more important. Yeah. Mm. On that cheery note, uh, Thomas, uh, your, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, I would like to, to add to what Dominic just said. Uh, I think you have basically two paradigms you observe. The one is, as Dominic mentioned, history repeats. I think that especially uh, is applied to the smaller events uh, where you accept that certain things won't go away. But the other extreme is uh, this won't happen again. And I think uh, risk managers are sometimes too quick in basically um, closing off with a crisis and thinking um, that this won't happen again. Um, and a lot of things, unfortunately, will happen again, either in, in a similar uh, form and shape or uh, something completely different, like, again, uh, what uh, what Dominic uh, mentioned in terms of, of conflicts uh, and so forth. So you should use the current crisis as a sort of preparation for future crisis and not basically reduce all the headcount and investment and so forth uh, because uh, you, you just assume um, that uh, you will enter a more tranquil uh, state in the future. Thank you. And finally, Jim. So based on what we've heard from everyone, operational risk events will occur. There will be incidents, there, there will be disruptions, there are pressure on people. And when that incidence occurs, then you really need to know, not just in terms of the business continuity measures, how we turn it on, but really the information sharing channels. It's critical with respect to third-party service providers. It's critical up to the executive management and the board. Probably all of us can think of circumstances where there was an incident and then the executive in the C-suite is calling you on the phone asking for information. You say, if you would let me off the phone, I could actually go and work on <laughs> the incident. One of the ways that we get around that is having defined protocols for the sharing of information. Brilliant. Okay, thanks everyone. We're That's tied to the new regulatory reporting requirements that are only evolving. Indeed, indeed. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, we had, uh, I think, a really good, really good session. As always, we could have gone on a much longer, particularly with the with the questions with the Q and A. Uh, so I'd like to thank our four speakers. I think you all agree have been been excellent. And uh, thanks everyone for for joining. Uh, the slides and uh, I believe a video of the of the event will be available on the IRM's website as usual. And I believe you'll get an email with the link to that in due course. And uh, it just uh, finally for me to just say thanks again and uh, look out for the next 
uh, IRM IOR webinar. And uh, we hope to see you again there. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.